I'm Brian Oldman, Director of the South Australian Museum, and welcome to this evening's lecture. Uh, firstly, I would like to start by acknowledging that we are meeting on Ghana land this evening. The Ghana people are the traditional owners and custodians of this land, and I respect their spiritual relationship with the country that has developed over the thousands of years. Their cultural heritage and beliefs are dynamic and remain important to the Ghana people of today. And now the Sprig Lecture. Firstly, I would like to make a special mention to our friends at Bundalier Wines, who support every Sprig Lecture, and I think you've been enjoying the, the fruits of their products uh, before you came upstairs. The Sprig Lecture series commemorates the life of Dr Reg Sprig, a most remarkable South Australian, who discovered the world's oldest fossilised animals in the Flinders Ranges in 1946. These animals lived around 560 million years ago, and the impressions of ancient life that Dr Sprig found are called the Ediacaran fossils. Ediacaran fossils are the oldest complex animal fossils in the world and are an integral part of the museum's collection and research. They're also going to be an integral part of the state of South Australia because actually we are looking to uh, appoint the state fossil and it will be from the Ediacaran assemblage. You have a choice of four to choose from. Uh, it's possible to vote at the museum uh, downstairs. You'll see little voting boxes. So I implore you to vote. A very important decision, what's going to be the state fossil for South Australia. So I'd now like to uh, introduce tonight's speaker, Dr Laura Wyrick. Dr Wyrick obtained a PhD from the Penn State University in 2012 after receiving a prestigious National Science Foundation PDRA fellowship to understand how commensal microorganisms contribute to infectious diseases. In addition to immunological and medical research, she's also developed a dual PhD program for biological scientists to learn and practice bioethics. In 2012, she began a postdoctoral research appointment at the University of Adelaide in the Australian Centre for Ancient DNA. Using her medical expertise, she helped establish calcified dental plaque, or calculus, as the only fossil record of human microbiota in existence and linked ancient and historic changes in human microbial communities to large shifts in health and disease. She has since reconstructed microbiota from Neanderthals and was the first person to analyse the commensal bacterial species in an extinct hominid. In 2015, Dr Wyrick obtained a prestigious Australian Research Council DECRA, congratulations, uh, aimed at reconstructing the diversity of human microbiota around the world, especially in indigenous peoples. For her research into these commensal bacteria species, she has received over 12 awards for research excellence, travelled to five continents, collected samples, and given over 40 guest lectures on the topic. Uh, she is regularly featured in the media, BBC, NPR, Science, Australasian Science magazine. The list is almost endless. And her commitment to understanding how commensal microorganisms contribute to disease and how they shape the world around us is changing how we view human health today. Please join me in welcoming Dr Laura Wyrick as she presents tonight's lecture, Lessons from Neanderthals, How Your Bacteria Contribute to Your Health, Your Thoughts and Your Past. Thank you. Thank you very much for that introduction. I'm very excited to be here tonight to talk to you about my favorite topic, the microbiome, the bacteria that live within your body. I first want to tell you a little bit about myself because I'm not an anthropologist, I'm not an archeologist, I'm a medical microbiologist. I obtained a PhD in immunology and medical sciences. But I decided to move here to the University of Adelaide to the Australian Center for Ancient DNA, because I really believe that stories and information from our past can actually inform things that we do in the future, such as modern medicine. And I work in a building, just a couple um, doors down from this, in the Darling Building at the University of Adelaide with a bunch of evolutionary biologists. And their main goal is to reconstruct how organisms are related on this planet, 
how they came into being, and how they related to one another. And there's been a lot of research looking at just the differences on the branch of one of those um, parts of the tree, the difference between chimpanzees and humans. But I would argue that evolutionary biologists have gotten it pretty much wrong. And that's because they're only thinking about those organisms, not the thousands of microorganisms that live inside of each of one of those um, organisms shown on this slide. So how do we know that organisms contain lots of microorganisms? Well, this all started in the 1600s with Antony Leeuwenhoek. And this man wasn't a microbiologist. Microbiologist wasn't even a term that existed yet. He was more of a tinkerer. And he actually developed the lenses that were put into the world's first microscope. And with that, he was able to see very small things. And he actually cleaned dental plaque from his teeth and put it under a microscope and was able to describe microorganisms for the first time. And he drew pictures of them, which are shown here. And he called them animacules, which just means tiny animals, because the word for microorganisms simply didn't exist yet. And if we look in dental plaque today, we can still see those same microorganisms present that he described over 400 years ago. And then there was a bit of a lull period for about 200 years. Not much was done in the microbiology field until two very famous scientists came along, Louis Pasteur and Robert Koch. Many of you have probably heard about these scientists. They're quite famous. And they were um, credited with developing germ theory, or the idea that bacteria can cause diseases in humans, that they can give you an infection. That idea didn't exist yet until these two gentlemen came on the scene. And Robert Koch was particularly um, responsible for culturing bacteria. He was the person who invented the Petri dish. And so once we were able to grow these bacteria, then we could study them in greater detail. We could understand how they cause disease and why they cause disease. The problem with this is, though, is that when you look under a microscope, you can still see thousands and thousands of different species. But we could only grow about 2% of them. And that's a very small portion of the pie. And that was until DNA sequencing came along. We now know today that microorganisms coat every single surface of this Earth. They're in the air that we breathe. They're in the surfaces that we touch. They're in the soil that we walk on. And they're even in areas that we can't see, things like deep sea vents, where bacteria feed off methane being released from the Earth's crust. Just to give you an idea of how diverse these microbial communities are, if you look at your hand for a second, every single inch of your skin is covered with 32 million microorganisms. Every single inch. So these microbial communities are very diverse, and they really do coat, really completely coat, every single surface present on this Earth. We began to learn a lot more about the microbiota, or the microorganisms that live within the human body, the things like bacteria, viruses, fungi, and even parasites, with the Human Microbiome Project. This project's been called the HMP Project. And instead of a single scientist, this was a collaboration of tens of different scientists across the United States that actually lobbied the American government for $115 million to be able to describe these microbial communities that were present in the human body and potentially link them to disease. And so with that study, they were actually able to show that about three pounds, or 1.4 kilograms, of your total body weight is actually bacteria. So when you step on the scale in the morning and you're maybe a little heavier than you want to be, you can really blame the microorganisms. And this accounts for about 1,800 species and over 100 trillion cells. 100 trillion. That's an enormous number. It's very difficult to wrap your head around how big that is. And so if we turn those bacteria into millimeters or into seconds, it might be slightly easier to understand. If each bacteria was a second, we would still have 3 million years. And if each bacteria were a millimeter, we could still go around the Earth 2,500 times. So the number of bacteria that you carry within your body is absolutely enormous. And this actually accounts for 50% of the total cells in your body, or even greater than 50% of the total cells in your body. So let's just stop and think about that for a second. You're actually not human. You're more bacteria than you are human. So when you wake up in the morning, you can really relate to the microorganisms that are within you that are, are guiding what you're doing in the morning, and not necessarily yourself. This is analogous to the Earth. If we thought about the planet for a second without any life, it would be very, very different than the world we know today. And that's just like you. Without your microorganisms, you would be very, very different than the human that you are today. 
You begin acquiring these microorganisms at birth, and you actually begin getting them the second that you're birthed into this world. So we find that people who are born via vaginal birth actually have different microorganisms in their body than people that were born via cesarean section. And that's because as an infant goes through the birth canal, it picks up its first microorganisms. Um, bacteria in the vaginal canal, most of them are called lactobacillus, lacto meaning milk. These microorganisms are given from mother to infant as a way of transferring a way to digest milk in those very first few hours of life. If you're born via a cesarean section, you typically have bacteria that are actually much more reminiscent of a doctor's hands and of the hospital environment because you did not pick up those microorganisms from your mother. These continue to change um, throughout the first few weeks of life, and we find that breastfeeding actually also has a whole other suite of microorganisms that are given to the child that also aid in health. And you can also continue picking these up from the environment, and your microorganisms um, continue changing over the first three years of your life. Once you reach about three years of age, they stabilize and become what we would call an adult microbiome. The interesting part about this is they're so unique, it actually forms a fingerprint for you. These microorganisms can actually be used in forensic cases to track you to a particular location. Something you may have touched at that site can actually be linked back to the microorganisms that are on your skin. It's a unique signal, and you have a unique set of microorganisms within you. But it's not just these microorganisms that are important. It's also the genetic content that they carry with them. And we call the genomes of all these bacteria in the body the microbiome. So it's not just the human genome that's important. It's also your microbiome. It's an additional genome that you carry with you. And within that microbiome, there are over 5 million bacterial genes. Now, if you know anything about the human genome, you would know that there's only a little over 20,000 genes, which might explain that why when we spent billions of dollars to sequence the human genome, we still didn't have all the answers to disease. That's really because we were missing most of the genome that's present in the human body. Because actually, your genome is actually 99% bacterial. So again, you're not human. You're really bacterial. And it's these genetic... Um, signatures that are within the genome that carry functions that are critical for your daily life. So these bacteria live with you, but they've also evolved with you. And so they, they perform functions that your own human body cannot perform. Some of these include food digestion. And this makes a lot of sense when we think about the bacteria living within our gut, living within our stomachs. They're going to eat the same things that you eat, and they're going to help you digest them. They're particularly good at digesting high-fiber foods. And in that digestion, they actually produce a lot of byproducts. And some of these byproducts are very essential for you, such as vitamin K. You cannot get vitamin K from your diet alone. You actually have to get it from the microorganisms within your gut that are producing it on a daily basis for you. And this is true for not only food things that you put in your mouth, but also drugs or pharmaceuticals. Bacteria are the first things to digest those within the body before it's presented to your own cells. And so this may explain why you and your partner maybe have to take different doses of drugs to get the same effect. We actually see that painkillers are metabolized very differently by different bacteria. So why a drug isn't successful in you may actually be because you have the wrong bacteria to digest the drug. These are also critical for developing your immune system. Because these microorganisms are so tightly linked with you from birth, they actually are very critical in developing a proper immune system that can both respond to pathogens and disease, but can also tolerate other healthy commensal microorganisms. It's really a balance that the bacteria have to teach your immune system to engage in. And with that, they also fight off other bacterial species directly. So microorganisms are constantly at war within your body. There's constantly a bacterial war going on every second of every day. And the helpful commensal bacterial species within your body are actually fighting off the invaders or the pathogens to try to prevent disease within your body. And they also do things like detoxify your body. Some chemicals you may not be able to tolerate or to digest, but bacteria may have a unique set of genes that can actually digest these toxins and actually protect you from some chemical exposures. So these functions are very critical to our health, but it also means that if you alter these bacterial communities, you get disease because you disrupt these functions. And so while these healthy microbial communities are performing these functions on a daily basis, if you have the wrong microbial communities, they then are not performing those functions in the way that they should. And there's been quite a few diseases that have been linked to the microbiome to date. 
Honestly, nearly every disease that's been studied now has a microbiome component. The first one that was discovered was actually obesity, and that's shown here in this cute little picture on the right. You have the very obese mouse on the left, a bit pudgy, and then the very lean mouse on the right-hand side. And Peter Turnbaugh, who's now at Stanford University, was able to take feces, or bacterial organisms from the gut, of the obese mouse and put it into the lean mouse. And with that, he made the lean mouse obese. Those bacteria are sufficient to cause obesity in mice, and since then has been shown they're sufficient to cause obesity within humans. And so now we're working to try to alter those, and I'll talk about some treatments to these diseases in a second. But this also works for malnutrition as well. So this is a disease that's common in Africa. It's called kwashiorkor, And this is actually from the Ghana language. It means the disease that the infant gets when the next baby comes. And so when infants are weaned off their mothers and they're put on a normal um, adult human diet, many of them don't have the right microorganisms to kind of digest that food properly. And they suffer from malnutrition and have very stick-like appendages and a, a big distended belly, as you can see here in the picture. And Jeff Gordon, who's in the United States, was able to show that you can actually replace microorganisms within these children and provide them a protein-rich diet in the form of peanut butter and actually cure this disease in these children. So we have an incurable disease that went to being curable simply by understanding the microbial communities within these children. It's not just your gut, though, that's influenced by these dysbiosis of these bacterial communities. You can also have alterations in oral health if you have disruption of the healthy commensal bugs in the mouth. And so dental plaque actually will build up over time and form a matrix called calculus, which is visible in that top picture. That's actually a hardened matrix of bacteria that's grown in someone's mouth who hasn't brushed their teeth for quite a while. Um, and that calculus matrix can actually start pushing down on the gums and deteriorating your gum tissue. And that's known as periodontal disease. And so I know we hear a lot about that using mouthwash, um, but this is actually what it looks like. The gums are bleeding, they're quite inflamed, and they're actually disappearing um, away from the tooth root in many cases. This is all due to the ba bacteria or the microorganisms present within the mouth. And there are some diseases that, that may not be so obvious. Things like mental health that are linked to the microorganisms within your body. Things like depression, anxiety, addiction, and even schizophrenia. So you may be wondering, how in the heck do bacteria control my mind? How would they control how I feel? Well, you have to remember that your nervous system is tightly linked with your immune system. For example, your brain is over half immune cells. You need to keep the nervous tissue very clean and free of any pathogens to keep it functioning correctly. But that immune tissue, or those immune cells, can also receive signals from other immune cells elsewhere in the body. So bacteria that live within your gut can stimulate your immune system, and through the gut-brain axis can actually transfer information to your brain. They can control what side of food that you might want to eat that particular day, or really what the bacteria want to eat. Um, and they can also control your personality and whether or not you get simple mental disorders. There's actually a clinical trial, two clinical trials, in fact, in the United States, looking at antibiotic therapies for schizophrenic patients. And they have seen a 20 to 30% improvement rate in schizophrenic patients with the use of antibiotics. If you know anything about schizophrenic cures, that's an enormous success. But I should mention that nearly every disease study to date does have a microbiome component. I've listed a couple more here, but the list could be pages and pages long. We really have to reimagine every single disease that we've investigated in the last 100 years, and now think about it from a microbiome perspective. Think about how the bacteria in the body also contribute to these diseases. So I told you that there were some potential treatments out there for these microbiome diseases. Um, and I'll go through a couple of these treatments briefly, but the end result is that none of them are working too well. <laughs> the first one is probiotics. Um, these are microorganisms that would be helpful that you would put into the human body. And I think the best example of this is actually yogurt. There's lactobacillus and bifidobacterium in yogurt that are helpful to you. And so your doctor tells you to eat yogurt to get these helpful microorganisms. The problem is you have to keep eating yogurt every single day because these bacteria don't seem to stay around. And that's because they're not well adapted. They're not suited to live within the human body. And so they're not going to do well when you put them into a whole circus of other microorganisms. So we can think about changing the environment. And that's through prebiotics. Prebiotics is simply a word for changing the nutrients or the chemicals of that environment such that it would be um, accepting of new microorganisms or that it may alter the state of bacteria that are successful within the body. 
We can also use things like phage therapy. Phage simply means bacterial viruses. So there are actually viruses out there that only attack bacteria. They don't attack human cells, but just bacterial cells. And we can take those and engineer them to only target specific microorganisms that we might want to get rid of. However, this technology is very, very new, and we haven't figured out yet how to use it in the clinical setting yet. And so lastly, there's fecal transplants. Some of you may have heard about these in the news. It's quite a sexy topic right now. Um, and this actually involves taking out feces from a healthy donor, putting it in a blender, and making it into a nice slurry, and then using a suppository type method to insert it into the next patient that's suffering from a particular disease. And the idea is that you're transferring microorganisms from a healthy individual to a sick individual to make them healthy. And the bacterium shown on the right is actually Clostridium difficile, or many of you may know it as C. diff. This is a nosocomal infection that people pick up in the hospitals after they've been there a long time, and it's associated with very severe bloody diarrhea, something that's very dehabilitating for the patients. And up until a couple years ago, it wasn't really curable. It's highly antibiotic resistant and wasn't responding to many of the treatments. Today, we now have a greater than 95% cure rate of C. diff infections using fecal transplants. So this is the one instance where it's been very successful to use a fecal transplant to um, alter someone's microbiome and change the bacteria in the body. But there's been a couple attempts to commercialize this, to make it much easier so that you don't have to find new donors. One example of this is actually a machine in Canada. It's very cutely called the repopulator. And this machine acts as a human gut. So you can put in feces on one end, and the machine will digest it and act as if it's a human gut, and will grow more feces for you that you can then put into um, a sick or diseased person. Um, and this machine's working quite well. It's had some regulation issues, so it's still not being used in the clinical setting yet. And the picture on the right actually corresponds to something you may have heard about in the last few weeks. It was dubbed the poop pill. And this is a pill that actually contains bacterial spores, which are just seeds for microorganisms that you could take orally, and it would give you a suite of microorganisms that could then grow within your gut. Um, and within the last two weeks, there's been a lot of information that's come out that a, a, a clinical trial in phase three setting actually showed this is completely ineffective, especially against C. diff infections. So it's not just giving the particular microorganisms, but it's also thinking about their ecology, how they grow, and giving them in the right proportions that appears to be important. And so if we're really to understand how to alter these microbiomes and treat disease, then we really need to understand how and why they change. And not just in a mouse system, but we need to understand how they change in humans, because it can be very different. And so researchers started trying to answer this question um, by comparing us to our most recent living ancestor, the chimpanzee. Um, and in this particular study, they compared the microbiomes from chimpanzees, bonobos, and humans living in the same area. And no, it wasn't Chris. Um, but what they showed on this PC plot on the top um, is actually that they have very distinct microbiomes. So to interpret this particular plot, all you need to know is that every single dot represents all the microbiota present in one individual. So each dot represents all the bacteria that we find in a single person or a single chimpanzee in this case. And what you can see on the left is that bonobos and chimpanzees, shown in green and blue, have very distinct microorganisms compared to humans living in the same environment. So this suggests to us that there was something evolutionarily different about the modern human microbiome, and that it's not necessarily conserved with chimpanzees, as we may have expected, um, and that modern humans have a unique microbiome, something that we need to study. And so in order to then go a step further and look at whether or not lifestyles or our cultural practices impact the microbiome, they compared chimpanzees to a wide range of hunter-gatherers. Um, Hunter-gatherers live very traditional lifestyles. It's very different from, say, people in industrialized lifestyles. The diets are very different. Their cultural practices are very different. And with that, they can have different suites of microorganisms. And so what researchers did was actually compare the diversity, or the total number, of different types of bacteria present in the body. And wild apes, including chimpanzees, have a much more diverse microbiome than hunter-gatherers in both Venezuela and Malawi. So hunter-gatherer microbiomes are very different than chimpanzees, um, but they're also more diverse than people living industrialized lifestyles, for example, in the United States. And so this suggests to us that it's not just lifestyle that's altered our microbiome. There could be an evolutionary component. There could be dietary components. Everybody seems a bit different, and it could be quite confusing. And over the past three years, we've actually been able to show that modern humans are missing 
quite a few of the microorganisms that we should have, or modern humans when I say living, humans living an industrialized lifestyle. Um, this really means that we've lost some of the bacteria that probably should be with us. And we think this has significant health consequences, but that's a, a topic for another night. So there's been a lot of research that has gone into understanding why these microbiomes are different and how they change. So we now know through a whole heap of studies that diet and a living environment and even the job that you have may impact the microorganisms that you have in your body. We know that exposure to different chemicals or even to other humans and pets can alter your microorganisms. For example, kissing someone is a, is a swapping mechanism of microorganisms. And your pets actually share bacteria with you as well. We can actually trace which pet you have based on the microorganisms shared between that pet and its owner. Things like diseases can also impact the microbiome. They can alter the healthy bacteria in the body. And medical treatment, should come as no surprise, also has an impact on the microbiota. If we take antibiotics, they kill the bad bacteria that they're after, but they also kill good bacteria. So they can have a significant impact on the microbial species that we find in the body. And this is, again, the same plot that you were looking at before. Um, and on the right, we have people living urban industrialized lifestyles in both Europe and the United States. And we can see that those yellow and orange circles are very, very different from the plethora of other colors on the left-hand side, which represent a wide range of hunter-gatherers from around the world. And so it seems that the biggest divide, or the biggest change from an industrialized microbiome, is actually industrialization. It's something that we're doing in our modern lifestyles that has altered microbial species in the body. But what is it? And it's actually important to then think about the past and think about people who are living industrialized lifestyles and think about their cultural history, think about their evolutionary history, and try to understand how that may have contributed to the bacteria that are also within their bodies. And so I'm just going to walk you through a small case study that actually is the history of Europe in the last 15,000 years, and what people have been doing in Europe that may have impacted their microbiomes. And so up until about 12,000 years ago, everyone in Europe is a hunter and gatherer. So they're either hunting and gathering, some groups are doing more or less of each, but they're obtaining their food from the environment. We know that they have stone tools, we know that they can kill large game, we also know that they have fire, and they can cook their food, whether it be plants or animal material. And we also know they have a little bit um, of cave art, they have a little bit of social structure, but largely they're small bands of humans that are roaming around the countryside following their meals. And this all changed when agriculture was invented. It was invented in the Middle East about 12,000 years ago, but then slowly spread into Europe. And it comes into Europe with the LBK culture, the Luria band ceramic culture. And this is just a word that we, we call for their pottery that, they're, um, that they brought with them. And these individuals were practicing agriculture. They had their own domesticated animals, but they were also planting a wide range of crops. And so their diet was largely carbohydrate-based. That's a far cry from the meat-based or the, the gathering-based diets of yesteryear. And we also know that these people, they have cattle, but they're not drinking milk. They're lactose intolerant for the most part. And so they have to then rely on these crops as their major food source. We then cruise into the Bronze Age and the Iron Age, where people begin to practice metallurgy and create different tools that advance the lifestyle that they have. Um, societies at this point become more complex. Even though farmers could now live in the same area in this, around 7,500 years ago, they now become even more complex. And you have cities building um, and, and really civilizations coming into play. But again, their diet is largely carbohydrate-based. And lastly, up until about 150 years ago, we have the Industrial Revolution that probably had a large impact on our microbiomes as well. And during the Industrial Revolution was the invention of the engine. Um, but that revolutionized a lot of different things in our lives. So it allowed us to, for the first time, on a large scale, process food. So we had to sterilize our food. We had to kill all the bacteria in it before we could put it in cans and jars and be able to save it for long-term storage. It also changed our ability to move around the Earth. Globalization started at this point. We were able to go places that we had never gone in very rapid, um, quick fashions. And it was also the, the dawn of modern medicine. We began to think about how drugs and things may be used um, in a large-scale setting to treat specific diseases. And so it becomes very difficult then to tell which one of these factors may have impacted the microbiome and which one of these factors may actually altered something um, of the microbial species that we have in modern industrial humans today. So we really had to ask the question, how did the modern human microbiome originate? Why do modern humans have a unique set of microorganisms? Where did this come from? How did we get them? 
And that's what um, we aim to do and what we aim to, to focus on and, and answer those questions. Um, and we don't have a time machine to go back into time, but we do have ancient DNA. And ancient DNA is the ability to obtain DNA molecules from the past, from different sample types, and then reconstruct what would have been in the past at a, at a given time. And so there are two different sample types that we can use to reconstruct ancient microbiota. One of them is coprolites. So these are preserved feces from humans. And they come in all shapes and sizes and colors and are quite disgusting to look at. Um, but they do maintain some of the microorganisms that were present in ancient humans. The problem with this is, is that they're also highly contaminated with environmental DNA. As soon as the coprolite was left on the ground back in the past, it was then contaminated with soil microorganisms and things from the environment. And there's also organic material in coprolites. And so as soon as they're deposited, the bacteria can continue to grow and they can continue to change. And so reconstructing an entire microbial community is very, very difficult then from this sample that has an altered state. Lucky for us, there's another sample type. And this is dental calculus. So again, this is dental plaque that is calcified into place. And so if you've ever drank a sugary drink and you feel that slime on your teeth, that's dental plaque growing. It's bacteria growing in response to that sugar that you just put in your mouth. And if you don't brush your teeth, and if you don't go to the dentist, that will calcify at night and build up. And it becomes a very hard structure. It's something analogous to concrete. It feels like a bone in your mouth. It's, it's a really hard, um, robust structure. And that's really resistant to any outside contamination. It locks bacterial DNA in place as the person is still living. And so this provides the perfect record to go back into time and understand what microorganisms people had back in the past. And so I'm going to walk you through a small case study of research we've been doing here at the University of Adelaide to use dental calculus to reconstruct the human microbiome and reconstruct where modern humans obtain these microorganisms from. And this story really begins in the bottom of the Natural History Museum in London. Um, and I can tell you that the bottom of the NHM, the Natural History Museum, is actually a bomb bunker from World War II. So you're surrounded by six feet um, of solid cement, and it's very quiet, and it's very cold, and it's very dark and damp. <laughs> but within that bunker, there are thousands and thousands of human skulls. So each one of these shelves is a bit of a library sliding shelf. And within each shelf contains hundreds of human skulls. And so many of us, as museum goers, we get to see the beautiful outside part of the museum, the displays that are put up. But we don't get to see the backside of the museum. And that's really where the wealth of information is stored and maintained. We're so fortunate to have museums willing to, to keep these collections and maintain them and store that information so that researchers such as myself can go into them and find dental calculus from thousands of years ago. And so I'd really like to say thank you to the Natural History Museum as well as some of the other museums around the world that have supported this project. And hopefully we'll be able to forge that relationship with the SA Museum. So once we identify a skeleton with calculus, we actually take it into a little makeshift office that we have and we remove that calculus from the teeth. We can actually use, do that using a small dental pick and the calculus falls right off of the surface of the tooth. So we don't damage the skeleton at all. It actually was a, a procedure that different anthropologists used to do, was to clean the teeth um, back in the day to see the teeth better. But they were removing that dental calculus. That thing that they were removing that was annoying and in the way is actually what we want. We want to keep that um, and sequence the bacterial DNA inside. And so in the Natural History Museum, we were able to obtain a large, wide range of European calculus samples. And so from some museums, we got Neanderthals, but from the NHM, we got a wide range of European humans. And so we were able to get some of those first early farmers, people from that LBK culture, individuals from the Bronze Age, from the Iron Age, as well as the Industrial Revolution, and then compare that to modern humans. And so this collection at the museum took us about two weeks to sample and, and obtain all the, the calculus samples from, um, but it was quite a, quite a learning experience, and there were some really interesting skeletons um, present in the museum. This actually happens to be one from PNG, a little closer to home. Um, and this skull was turned into a necklace. So it was the chief of another tribe um, that was turned into a necklace by another chief as a, a stature symbol um, when his tribe was conquered by another one. Um, and if you can zoom in and look on the tooth there, you can see a big glob of gunk. Um, that's actually dental calculus. And we were able to sample that as part of another study that we're doing, looking at Pacific um, individuals and their dental calculus and their microorganisms through time. 
But once we got all these calculus samples back to the lab, the first thing we had to do was actually look to see that there were microorganisms preserved within the calculus. And so you can put dental calculus under a scanning electron microscope, and you see a wonderful picture such as the one in the middle. And it actually looks like tree rings. You can see dental calculus forming in a ring-like structure through time as it grows. In ancient individuals, they didn't have dentists to remove it, and so it really grew throughout the whole life of someone's um, of an individual's life. It, it grew for a long time. And if you zoom in even further, you can see the picture on the right, which is those individual bacterial cells that are still preserved within thousand-year-old calculus. And I hope you can recognize that picture from Lewin Hoke that I showed earlier. It's those same microorganisms that he described over 400 years ago that we're now still seeing today in calculus. And so once we were able to identify that calculus preserves bacteria, we were actually able to then take the samples into our ancient DNA facility and extract DNA from the calculus. And our DNA facility is just down the street. It's in the botanical gardens on Hackney Road, um, far away from any of the other molecular biology that happens in the lab. And we take the samples in there, and it's an ultra-clean, ultra-sterile facility. We're trying not to introduce any modern DNA into our samples. And so this is actually me. Um, I'm in a full body suit. I've got a face mask on. I have three pairs of gloves and I have um, positive air pressure blowing back at me. So I can't introduce any of my own DNA, any of my own microorganisms, into these ancient samples. So once we're able to extract the DNA from these samples, we can then use that to be, we can actually sequence that, and we can use that to reconstruct the microbial communities that are present in ancient humans' mouths. And I'll walk you through some of our, some of our results that we've had. So, First off, we wanted to understand whether or not hunter-gatherers that lived way back into time, about 30 to 40,000 years ago, shared microorganisms with chimpanzees, or whether or not humans have always been kind of distinctly different. And there are not many very ancient humans that live in Europe. Actually, Europe was pretty much dominated by Neanderthals up until about 40,000 years ago. So for those of you who don't know who Neanderthals are, they are um, best cousin, I would say. <laughs> They're a recent living aunt or cousin of ours, um, very closely related. And they roamed in Europe until about 40,000 years ago when they went extinct. But they lived lifestyles very analogous to ancient atomic, anatomically modern humans. So we can use them as a proxy to understand what ancient humans would have been doing because their lifestyles would have been very, very similar. And we compare that to modern humans, which happen to be most of my PhD students in the lab. And so we were able to reconstruct the microbiome from each of these individuals. Um, and I'm showing that data here. So the pie chart represents bacterial phyla. Phyla is a taxonomic term for lots and lots of families of bacteria. There's more diversity within every single one of those colors than there are mammals on this entire Earth. So this represents thousands and thousands of microbial species. And what we can see is that chimpanzees and Neanderthals share many more colors than they do with modern humans there's much more blue shared with chimpanzees and Neanderthals compared to modern humans. And that blue color represents gram-positive microorganisms. These are the healthy commensal bacteria that actually bind onto the surface of your teeth. And these are actually the bacteria that can also help repair the enamel on your teeth. They're quite good to have. They're something you wouldn't want to get rid of. And that's in stark contrast to the amount of red that's present in modern humans. The red colors represent gram-negative taxa. While some of them are commensal and healthy, other ones cause disease in the mouth and are tightly linked to periodontal disease. We see that these are much higher in modern humans than they were in very ancient humans practicing traditional lifestyles. So we can then take those three sample types, chimpanzees, Neanderthals, and modern humans, and compare them to the wide range of ancient humans that we had. And on this graph, instead of showing pie charts, I've simply stretched those pie charts out to be a nice bar plot for you. And so the first difference that we noticed um, when we were comparing these to ancient humans was actually a difference between different hunter-gatherer groups. So in the group on the left, we have chimpanzees, the El Cidron Neanderthals from Spain, and some African hunter-gatherers that were very close to the ones living in Europe. And we actually see that they have a similar microbiome that's very different from the group on the right, the Spie Neanderthals from Belgium, as well as other hunter-gatherers that lived in Europe. And we had a lot of thinking about, to do about this. I and mean, what we finally kind of concluded from cultural evidence was that hunting was the primary factor that delineated these two groups and their microbiome. And so it looks like Neanderthals, depending on how much hunting they were doing, can actually have two different sets of microbiomes. And that 
chimpanzees and Neanderthals and hunter-gatherers, if they're not doing any hunting, actually share a microbiome. So this suggests that ancient humans shared microorganisms with chimpanzees up until very recently. The microorganisms that we have now actually begin to change when we started hunting and started probably eating large amounts of meat. The next difference that we observed um, in the microbiome was actually when people started farming or practicing agriculture. So we see that all the farmers that were present in Europe that came in with their new technology of agriculture actually are very different from any of the hunter-gatherer groups that used to live in Europe. And um, I'll talk about why we think this is in a second, but it basically suggests that agriculture may have predisposed industrialized Western humans to the microbiome that we now have today. You can see that red bar is much more prominent in agriculturalists and shared more commonly with modern humans than it is with those other hunter-gatherers. And the last change that we noticed was actually a big difference between ancient agriculturalists and modern humans. And this suggests to us that the Industrial Revolution had, again, another large impact on the human microbiome. So this suggests to us a couple of different things. The main one is that humans and chimpanzees and Neanderthals did share a microbiome at one point. That's a huge thing. We don't share that anymore. And that suggests that the microbiome was evolutionarily conserved. It was something that was so maintained that we kept with us specific microorganisms until very recently. And that our lifestyle, including hunting and farming and the things we did in the Industrial Revolution, have actually altered those bacteria that should have been shared with humans and chimpanzees and Neanderthals. So dental calculus is quite a unique sample because it not only contains bacteria, but it also contains some of the food particles that you eat. Just like food gets stuck in your teeth, food particles can also get stuck within dental calculus. And so we were able to sequence not only bacterial DNA from calculus, but also food DNA in calculus and try to correlate that to the microbiome to determine if it's actually the diet of these people that's impacting their microbiomes, not just their cultural differences. And within these four groups, we saw that they have very distinct diets. So within the forager gatherers, they're eating things like pine cones, mushrooms, even bark from trees. And that's very different from the hunter gatherers, the people eating large game. For example, from the Neanderthals and Spie in Belgium, we were actually able to reconstruct woolly rhino DNA, showing that Neanderthals actually did hunt some of those big woolly beasts in Europe back in the past. Um, and I should note that both of these diets are very, very different from what's been termed the paleo diet of today. These people are eating opportunistic diets. They're finding anything they can to be eaten. They're not going to the grocery store and picking out a very beautiful selection of meat and vegetables. Um, it's very, very different from what we would call the paleo diet. So this is much more an opportunistic diet um, and is very, very different. And these two diets are very different from the DNA that we found in ancient agriculturalists, which correspond to a large range of grasses, including barley and wheat. And this is very, very different from the diet that we see in modern humans, <laughs> which doesn't have much DNA. <clears throat> so these really mean that dietary changes that are associated with these cultural revolutions are actually what have impacted our microbiome. Changing your diet changes your microbiome. Again, it gets back to the bacteria eating the same things that we eat. If you alter your diet, you alter the bacteria. But does that mean that you actually alter the diseases in the body as well? Well, we argue that yes, you do. Um, and that's shown here. So the picture on the left, you can imagine the bottom is the tooth surface. And on top of that is a wide range of different type of microorganisms that are all binding together and working together. And these were shared between different hunter-gatherer groups and agriculturalists. And it's only when agriculture comes along that you see the gram-negative organisms come into play. And it's these organisms that are now associated with oral disease as well as things like obesity and diabetes. And this correlates very beautifully with the, the paleonto paleontological record as well. Hunter-gatherers had beautiful teeth. I mean, I held a, a spee Neanderthal jaw in my hand, and I wish I had teeth as good as he did. There's no cavities. There's no periodontal disease. They have immaculate teeth. And that's in stark contrast to some of those early farmers that came into Europe. Your mouth just hurts when you look at their skeletons. They have massive abscesses, they have cavities, um, and they have lots of periodontal disease. And so it's really through this microbial change that we see an alteration in disease. That's, again, linked simply to your diet. And it's quite interesting to note that this is likely all because of one single microorganism. Um, and this is a bacteria called Fusobacterium. And here he's really forming a bridge 
between the gram-positive organisms and the gram-negative microorganisms. So he's really the linking bacteria between these guys within their big structure. And so it's really a keystone species that's been introduced into the microbiome that allows the whole structure to change and allows the whole community to change. But this also provides a new disease target to try to eliminate some of these gram-negative organisms. If we can wipe out Fusobacterium, we can also wipe out the organisms on top of that and potentially eliminate some of the oral diseases that our society struggles with today. But do these dietary changes impact our modern health? So they may have changed our health in the past, but are they changing our health today? And again, I would argue yes. And so I'll walk you through a small case study and a study that we're conducting here in Australia with Aboriginal Australians um, to tell you about why I think that these evolutionary processes actually impact our health today. They impact modern health. So I want you to think about Aboriginal Australians and their lifestyles prior to European arrival. They were living a hunter-gatherer lifestyle, that opportunistic diet I was telling you about. This is not an agriculturalist diet. This is not a westernized, industrialized diet. And that was until about 150 years ago. And then Europeans arrive. Europeans have had 8,000 years to adapt to an agriculturalist microbiome. And now you have mixing of these two microbiome structures. You have hunter-gatherer microbiomes, and you have industrialized microbiomes, and you have them mixing together. And so does that mean that you have alterations in health? Well, certainly if we look at the health statistics, we think that we do have major alterations in Aboriginal Australian health. And so, for example, kidney disease is seven times higher, but the other diseases in Aboriginal Australians are much higher than they are in non-Indigenous people here in Australia. And recent studies have even shown that things like diabetes and obesity, things that we know are linked to the microbiome, are up to five times higher in Aboriginal Australians than they are Indigenous Australians. And you could argue maybe that's a socioeconomic factor, maybe that's a genetic factor, um, but that's why the Australian government developed a program called Close the Gap to try to address some of those issues with Aboriginal Australian health and try to improve Aboriginal Australian health um, addressing social issues. The problem with that is, is although they were able to improve socioeconomic factors within those communities, they were not able to improve health. And this suggests to us that there's probably a different component. There's something else that we're not thinking about. There's the microbiome. We haven't thought about the microbiome in relation to indigenous disease. And so we've looked at the microbiome in Aboriginal Australians living a Western industrialized lifestyle and compared that to, again, individuals of European descent living here, again, in Adelaide. And what we see is that people of Aboriginal Australian descent have a very unique microbiome compared to non-Indigenous people, even though our lifestyles are pretty analogous. And so this suggests to us that it's actually their evolutionary history. It's that hunter-gatherer microbiome that they probably had before that's being maintained somewhat even in this industrialized lifestyle that they now live. We see that the Aboriginal Australian microbiome is more diverse, again indicative of a hunter-gatherer um, microbiome, even though that's not their lifestyle anymore. And we see unique species that are linked to that hunter-gatherer microbiome. For example, we see a bacteria called endomicrobium. Endomicrobium is typically only found in termite guts. This is the bacteria that allows termites to digest wood and actually obtain nutrients from it. And we find this organism in Aboriginal Australians. And so when you're eating bush tucker, you actually need protein. And that's usually found through termites in some of the um, drier regions of Australia. And so we believe that this organism is actually introduced into the Aboriginal Australian microbiome through their diet. It was picked up through some of the food sources that they were eating. And this microorganism would have been very beneficial to have if you were living in the bush and you were living an opportunistic diet. But in a westernized, industrialized society where you have enough nutrients, having a microorganism that's capable of getting a lot of energy from food may not be a beneficial thing, it may be a problematic, harmful thing. And it's then easy to understand why specific microorganisms maintained from a hunter-gatherer microbiome such as this may allow diseases to manifest and to be caused in unique ways in indigenous populations, differently to how they would be caused in non-indigenous populations. So that's why my lab is working with a bunch of indigenous groups from around the world to reconstruct their microbiomes and understand whether or not diseases in those populations are linked to their health, and to use ancient DNA to understand what the microbiomes were of their ancestors prior to European arrival in these different areas across the world. Because we really need to think that diet really does alter our microbiome. And if diet alters the microbiome, we know that it's altering health. And we need to then consider every single one of these <laughs> populations and how their microbiomes might be different from an evolutionary perspective, from a historical perspective, 
And we need to take those microbiome differences into account when we talk about treating diseases and designing new treatments. And it's really only by looking at the microbiome, especially in different populations, and understanding the evolutionary history of these microbiomes will we then be able to treat diseases effectively in all populations. And so with that tonight, I'd like to leave you with just a few questions to get you thinking about your microbiomes. What's the history of your microbiota? Were your ancestors hunter-gatherers? Were they farmers? What microorganisms might you have in you that were given to you by your ancestors? And how do these microorganisms impact your health? Are they causing some diseases? Are they influencing how much weight you might gain? What are they doing for you? And what have you done today that might have altered your microbiome? Did you drink a sugary drink? Did you eat a hunter-gatherer diet? What were you doing today that may have impacted the bacterial species within your body? And with that, I'd just like to thank the Australian Center for Ancient DNA and the University of Adelaide for supporting my research and, and supporting me to come to Australia and, and do this research. And I'd also like to say thank you to the dental calculus team. So we have about nine PhD researchers working on dental calculus projects from around the world to try to reconstruct microbiomes and how they may be linked to health and our culture. So with that, thank you. And I'd love to take any questions. Um, there will be a couple of microphones uh, coming around the floor for questions. So if you want to ask a question or, or admit what you did to your own personal microbiome today, um, feel free. Yes, question there, lady? No, I, I wanted to ask, you mentioned that you held the skulls of very ancient people in your hands and said they've got no calculus. I just wondered, um, presumably those folk perhaps didn't have a life expectancy of longer than perhaps 20 or 30 or 40 years, and if that may have contributed to the lack of or reduced calculus, if that had anything to do with it. Did you see any, you know, we, I presume you were able to give an age to the skulls and the teeth that you're looking at? Yeah, we were. So calculus actually doesn't form in children, and so only by the time you're about maybe 16 or 17 do you begin forming calculus. The, the hormones in your body kind of start supporting that bacterial growth in a unique way. And so certainly we can date a lot of the skulls that we look at, um, and we can tell whether or not they're, they're very aged, you know, based on the paleopathological information that we have for those skeletons. Um, certainly they, they were living shorter lives than we have today, but in most cases it's enough um, of a life to develop kind of large calculus formation. To be honest, in most of the farmers um, that we've analyzed, they have calculus that's sometimes even bigger than your teeth. I mean, if you can imagine your, your face being poofed out because you almost have so much calculus that it's a whole second row of teeth. Um, and in the hunter-gatherers, they actually live typically longer than the farmers. Their diet was much more nutritious and, and came from a broad range of foods. When we shifted to agriculture, we really only ate one type of food, and with that, anemia became rampant. That's, that's the, one of the big diseases. But because we were living in closer social circles as well, infectious diseases also increased. And so, um, you know, the life expectancy, even when we see larger amounts of calculus, is actually much lower. And so <laughs> it's a different um, dichotomy to how much calculus we see. As a result of your uh, research, have you changed your microbiome or your diet? Yeah, so the question is, have I changed my microbiome due to my diet? Um, I, I surely do think about what I eat now. I guess I'll put it that way. <laughs> um, it's very difficult to know that you're going to alter your microbiome by eating something you know is bad for you um, and that that can contribute to your health. I, I think we all know that, that we know we should be eating healthy diets. We know we should be eating a diverse, wide range of nutrients. Um, and yet we still kind of sometimes pick to eat chocolate and candy bars and things. Um, so it is very difficult to kind of reprogram your brain um, how to eat. But I, I certainly do find myself eating a high, more high-fiber diet um, and really thinking about a mixed um, source of dietary foods for myself. Thank you. Gentlemen? Um, you, you talked about particularly Indigenous Australians and um, recognising that the microbiome that they carry is, is unique. And... Uh, will affect their health. How easy is it to make rac rapid changes in that microbiome? So if they're, um, say, eating a largely westernised diet um, and their microbiome isn't coping with it, how easy is that to change? 
It's a really good question because it's, you obviously can't put everyone back on a hunter-gatherer diet. That's not an option. Um, and so really we must rely probably then on medical interventions that can alter microbial communities within the body. And there's a lot of people spending a lot of hours working on that. Um, and so it's not the focus of my lab because I really truly believe other groups um, will surpass us and be able to figure out what some of those interventions should be. It's simply our goal to report what those differences are so that we know how to change it in the correct way. Um, but absolutely, altering diet is probably the first way to start. It's the biggest thing that we can see to change, but how to alter it and um, how to do it in an ethically sustainable way is also a, another big issue. But certainly, you know, things we can use antibiotics potentially in a way to actually treat microbiomes if they're severe enough that they would be impacting diseases like obesity and, and things like that. So it's still early days is the short answer, I guess. Um, and we're not exactly sure how to treat them the best way, but, but certainly I think medical intervention um, will probably need to be a factor. Hello. When I studied microbiology several years ago, no one told us anything about this sort of <laughs> stuff. So my question is, what references could you suggest I follow, and what is all this research journals published in to keep up to date with it all? <laughs> That's a great question. So th this is a really new research field. The Human Microbiome Project that I was talking about is only eight years old at this point. It was started in 2008 and finished in 2012. <clears throat> And in research terms, this is an infant field. It's very, very new. It's very, very young. Um, and it really relied on a lot of the DNA sequencing technologies to come up to snuff um, in order to us to be able to understand these microbial communities. And so, to be honest, even teaching students, we're struggling because there aren't textbooks yet about this. <laughs> and so we're having to write book chapters and, and write things to try to teach students about these, um, about these issues and about the science and about how you go about looking at a microbiome. Um, but the good thing for us is that a lot of the research today is being published in very high-profile journals. Um, quite often there are some that are open access. Um, but it, that's the tough part about teaching the public, is that it's all kind of in scientific literature. There's not much um, public science that's kind of been published. But that said, there are a couple of really good books out there. Um, one is by Rob Knight. He's a microbiologist that works in the United States that helped founded the Human Microbiome Project. Um, and he has a very easy, uh, you know, public science type approach to explaining the microbiome and how it's linked to health. Martin Blasler is also another NYU scientist who's written a very um, good book. And, and Ed Young, who's a popular science writer who writes a lot about different scientific issues, just came out with a book about three days ago about the microbiome. Um, I think it's called I Am Multitudes. Does that answer your question? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Go take the microphone, please. So, no, no, other people can hear you. Okay. Thank you for a lovely lecture. Uh, my question is, you've talked a lot about Europe and the research material. Have you had access to material from Africa and the Rift Valley, for example? So we're working on that. That's actually what my, my Decker Fellowship is to do, is to reconstruct the evolutionary history of microorganisms, not just in Europe, but to go after it in every single continent on this planet. Um, we're just wrapping up a study in South America where we've actually looked at um, calculus from about 10,000 years ago all the way through to the present, even looking at that alteration when Europeans arrive in South America. Um, and we've, we're working on it in the Pacific Ocean, so we're reconstructing all the microbial communities on all the Pacific islands right now. Um, we're working here in Australia to reconstruct this microbiome. Um, and there's some work in North America, although that's limited by a lot of the sample availability. Um, but we certainly have worked a bit in Africa at this point as well. Again, the sample preservation in Africa is actually an issue. To get ancient DNA from samples, you need well-preserved samples. And so anything that's been in a desert that's been super dry and baked in the sun is not going to have good DNA preservation. And so we have to work in areas where we'd be able to find good samples um, in places that there's good DNA preservation. So it does limit some of the places that we can work um, or how far back into time we can reconstruct um, the evolutionary microbiome. But absolutely, to do this same study on every single continent is our goal right now. Okay. Is this someone, the lady at the back there? Okay. Hi. Um, are you looking, are you speaking to politicians and the people who are delivering the closing the gap um, <laughs> efforts because probably a lot of the money's going into things that just aren't useful. No, no wonder that they're not getting anywhere. 
I haven't spoken to anybody um, as far as a politician goes in that regard, but um, I would love the opportunity to. And we've put in quite a few NHMRC grants this year targeted at these specific questions because we really do think that this is very critical information to get out to the public and get out to the policymakers and to the politicians. Um, so we hope within this next funding round that the government agrees with our, our project ideas and agrees with these principles and these ideas such that they'll support our funding to continue doing this research and, and get, the, get the news out to an even wider crowd. Thank you. The gentleman here. Can, can you wait for the microphone? We can hear your question. It's just coming. I'm, I'm sure that I'm sure the uh, work on the calculus is is really great, but could this be the tip of the iceberg because of a much greater flora in the gut? Than on the teeth. Thanks. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, and you know, using ancient DNA, we really are limited to calculus, and so we're limited to the oral microbiome. But that said, it's just it may be because the most research has been done in the gut. It's true that the most microorganisms in your body actually live within the gut, but it's because it's where the nutrients are most <coughs> dense. Oral microorganisms can actually very much contribute to your systemic health. So, in addition to the periodontal disease and the the nasty diseases I showed. They can actually um, escape. So oral microorganisms can get into your blood system, and that probably happens through flossing or from abrasion in your mouth. And once they get into your blood system, they can colonize all sorts of systemic organs. So the famous one is streptococci colonizing the heart tissue. It can actually give you a heart attack. Fusobacterium, that microorganism that's a keystone species, that can actually bind to your gut tissue and cause colon cancer. Um, and they're now linking some of the oral viruses to things like Alzheimer's and some of the mental diseases that we see later in life. So, so certainly, I think taking a deeper look at the oral microbiome and how it impacts our systemic health is something we need to do. It just hasn't been done yet. Do you have any more questions? I think there's, there's a, and Mike, there's a gentleman at the front. Thank you very much for an interesting talk. Can you tell me, you mentioned that the that humans essentially are microbes. What microbe formed the mitochondria? Sorry, I couldn't hear. Could you repeat what, the question? Please? What was the microbe, the remnant of the microbe in our bodies, in every cell, in every unicellular organism, is a mitochondria? What microbe might have formed that? Yeah, so you're asking about endosymbiotic theory, I assume. Um, so the idea is that way back when we had single cellular life in the Earth, maybe six billion years ago or, or however long it was, um, that you actually had one bacterium eating another bacterium, and that bacteria was able to survive inside that cell, and that that's what evolves and goes on to form the mitochondria, that is the powerhouse within all of our eukaryotic cells. And um, using genetic tools, we can try to reconstruct what microorganism that might have been using the mitochondrial genome that's still a remnant of that bacterial species. Um, and so far, it looks like it's a chlamydia-type species. But again, it's, it's so difficult to put a name on it when it's billions of years ago that, that it would have been that species. Um, but certainly, yeah, you can use the genetic tools to try to think um, and imagine what it might have been. And it is somewhat related to some um, chlamydia-based species. But um, yeah, it's just so far off. It doesn't really have a name yet. <laughs> when you were talking about the connections between uh, the bacteria and the uh, between chimpanzees and humans, is does that suggest there's any connection to the consumption of bush meat? It's a good question. So the um, <laughs> yeah, I, I'm not exactly sure is is the short answer to your question. Um, certainly, a lot of diseases are transferred from chimps into into humans and. When we actually look at Neanderthals, um, we can actually see that Neanderthals and humans swap bacteria as well. So I didn't talk about any of that research tonight, but um, we can actually tell that about 100,000 years ago, Neanderthals and humans were swapping bacteria, probably when we were interbreeding with them. Um, and so there's a lot of factors like that, like humans eating bush meat or interacting with other primate species that probably did have a big effect on transfer of microorganisms. Um, certainly when you think about these hunters and their microbiomes being different, we have to think about how hunter-gatherers eat meat. 
they don't just take the nice sirloin and put it on the grill. They eat everything on the animal. They eat all the innards, they eat the intestines, they eat the, the heart and lungs. Um, certainly when I was living with the hunter-gatherer community this last summer, um, I came upon them eating the hearts raw, and they were dripping blood. Um, and so that's not something we would do, even though we eat meat in this um, industrialized type culture. And so that introduces a whole different suite of microorganisms. It could introduce bacteria from the guts of animals actually directly into humans. And so we need to kind of try to retrace some of the, the histories of each of these individual species. Yeah. Uh, hi. Mm -hmm. um, have you, with the HMP, have you looked at uh, possible sports enhancement uh, and how to make people go faster? Yeah, that's a great question. I don't know that anybody's looked at that yet. <laughs> we do know that exercise impacts your microbiome, um, and that's I was probably... thinking more of the financial. Ah, okay. So this is a good business idea. <laughs> um, no, I don't know of anybody of anybody looking at that yet. Um, but certainly there's a lot of companies and a lot of startup companies that are happening um, to try to modify the microbiome. I think the most recent one I saw this week was actually a probiotic for your house. So you can spray your bacteria with healthy bacteria and then breathe them in. Um, you know, so there's a lot of financial benefits to some of these ideas about altering your microbiome. It's just whether or not they actually work is a different story. There's a mic. There's a lady in the aisle. You mentioned the um, difference between the biome of the um, microbiome of vaginal births, mm -hmm. babies, and cesarean. Mm -hmm. Is one? What are the health differences, and if it's healthier to have a vaginal birth, what is being done about that? Yeah, so all the evidence points to the fact that vaginal births are healthier because we, we can understand those microorganisms are evolutionary programmed to go into infants straight away, and they provide health benefits very early in life. Um, it's Because we just found out about this about three to five years ago, it's very difficult to understand what the long-term health effects are, but they are actually tracking infants now that are about four years old. Um, to understand what those differences are, it's, it's likely that cesarean births are linked with things like asthma and some of the autoimmune diseases that we see later in life. Um, but Ruth Lay, who's at NYU, actually thought up kind of an ingenious solution to babies that are born via cesarean section, and that's actually to insert a gauze into the woman's vagina. So when she has a cesarean section, the baby can immediately be pulled out and then rubbed with the gauze, which will give the, the infant those vaginal microorganisms that it should have gotten had it had an, a, you know, a vaginal birth. And that actually does show that it, it does provide those vaginal organisms to the, to the child. Um, and she's actually started a company <laughs> um, to develop that uh, as a treatment for, for moms who are giving cesarean section births. Gentleman over there. Would, you, would you like to comment on the, on the Western use of antibiotics? I would. <laughs> <laughs> Um, you know, antibiotics were a miracle cure when they came out in the 1950s, um, you know, especially during World War II. This was a life-saving thing that kept soldiers from getting infections when they had battle wounds in the field. Antibiotics certainly have their place, and they certainly have their use. We would not have the populations we have today without them. That said, when people developed antibiotics, we didn't know anything about the microbiome, and we didn't know that there was actually risks associated with antibiotics. We didn't know that they were killing our healthy organisms at the same time we were killing these bad organisms. And so today, we really need to urge medicos and, and doctors to rethink how they prescribe antibiotics. They should really only be given if they're necessary. And, and certainly speak with your GP about this. I'm, I'm not a doctor to give you recommendations, but we certainly need to weigh the risks associated with antibiotics and, and probably treat them much more, um, with much more reverence than we do today. They certainly are not candy, um, and they can't be taken quite a bit. I mean, I know the average dose for a three-year-old is 13 different doses by the time they're three years old in the United States. Um, that's an enormous amount of antibiotics that has a really large effect on your microbiome and is actually directly correlated to the, the epidemic of obesity in the United States. And so we need to think about antibiotics, and we need to think about when they should be prescribed and why they should be prescribed. Thank you. And do we have a final question? Final two, two, two final questions, <laughs> one on each side. Politicians like to talk about commercialisation, especially now. So if you were to speak about commercialisation, would that increase your funding the way we are now? And if I can ask one second one. Um, job and bacteria, you said that different jobs can have, I think you said, can have different bacteria. So I'm very interested in that. 
<laughs> yeah, so the first question is um, commercialization. And, and actually, the past two weeks, we've had a lot of conversations about whether or not we should be developing some microbiome-based companies. Um, for example, the U.S. has companies that will sequence your microbiome. You can do a swab and send it in, and a company will tell you what bacteria you actually have. That doesn't exist here in Australia, um, simply because it hasn't been developed yet. Um, and it's researchers like me or someone in my team that could actually develop a company that does that. And so, especially here in Australia, there's a lot of room for commercialization of microbiome research. Um, even if it's not for profit, you can turn those profits around right back into research, right? Um, and there's a lot of room to develop a lot of the treatments and the therapies, and so absolutely, I think that's an, a thing we have to start thinking about as researchers and how we can bring the private sector into our research. Um, and your second question about whether or not jobs influence the microbiome, they certainly do, um, but we understand very little about it. So uh, the best example is actually in hunter-gatherer populations where you have very divergent jobs. So the men are, um, especially in the, the Hadza hunter-gatherers in Africa, the men are out hunting every day. Um, so they're far away from where the women are, and the women are foraging for roots and tubers. And they actually have very unique bacteria that allow them to digest raw roots and tubers. And the men simply don't have these. Um, and it's not because there's sexual differences, it's because their jobs are actually different. But in an industrialized setting, exposure to chemicals and um, even things that we find in our food all the time actually has a big impact on your microbiome. So if you're at your workplace and you're exposed to chemicals on a regular basis, um, you can best believe it probably has an impact on your microbiome. Um, I think the biggest example of this is, is emulsifiers in foods, you know, things that make foods fluffier or, or um, you know, take a particular shape. They actually drastically impact your microbiome. Um, and so we have to think about what we're adding to foods and what we're exposing to people on a regular basis and how that influences their health simply by altering the bacterial communities in their bodies. Okay. And final question, gentlemen, oh, over there. I was just wondering whether you pick up respiratory flora in plaque as well. We absolutely do. So um, this plaque is really a mechanism to catch anything that goes in and out of the mouth. And so we pick up anything that you could cough up as well. Um, and so we've actually been able to identify a couple different very interesting respiratory diseases and even gastrointestinal diseases, especially in Neanderthals. So we were able to show that Neanderthals have DNA that matches to whooping cough or to pertussis. Um, it's very difficult to say whether or not they actually had a whooping cough infection or whether or not they were able to carry that asymptomatically. Um, and the other uh, disease that we found in Neanderthals that was quite interesting is actually microsporidia, which is a gastrointestinal disease, but it also causes you to throw up quite a bit. Um, so it's likely that we're catching the DNA as things are coming back out. And if you're throwing up, you're likely probably pretty sick. Um, and actually, in that Neanderthal, we're able to show that he's self-medicating himself. So he's taking things that are natural pain relievers and natural antibiotics. Um, and we can actually show with the skeleton that he's quite sick at the time of his death. So um, some of these can be used for very specific archaeological questions and anthropological questions. Um, and I could give a whole other talk about the specific bugs that we find in all these different humans and what that means for their health and, and what they were doing in life. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm sure you'd like to thank Laura for a most uh, fascinating talk. Thank you. <laughs> So thank you for coming to the South Australian uh, Museum this evening and I wish you all a very safe journey home. Thank you. Thank you.